You're listening to an uncensored live replay on ZRadioLive.com. We have a special guest with us today. Uh, and I don't know how else to introduce him except for this. He is the man with no face, but he can scream his opinion as loud as he can. He has such a history with the internet community. He has over 5 million views on YouTube, including not, and not including his old channels, by the way. He goes by many allies, but his name is Jim81 Jim, a.k.a. the Internet Aristocrat. Mr. Medicare, hello. How are you? Uh, I'm doing good. How are you doing? Good. Is this this is like kind of your theme song? I feel like every time I join, uh, every time I join your channel, this is what I hear. So I had to play it. <laughs> no, no, that was just the cheapest, uh, uh, most free audio track that I could find. <laughs> so, <that's what> I <laughs> so yeah, that works. That's my theme song. That's there you good. go. Yeah. Well, it's a nice little bass track. Listen to this. There we go. Mm. Music. Royalty free. That's the way to go. Yeah. That is the way to go. What song would you have chosen, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jam? If I could just pick anything I wanted? Yes. Yeah. Oh, God, I'd probably go with some terrible weeaboo shit. <laughs> <laughs> would be some obscure anime opening that everybody would fucking hate. That's that would be what I would go with. <laughs> well, Jim, it's great to have you on the show today. Um, I really do appreciate you uh, coming on because literally I thought out of all the millions of messages you got on Facebook, why would you answer some guy named Zach who's a Jew? <laughs> Oy vey. I know, Oy vey. I've, I've walked into a trap. What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. I'm very confused. <laughs> well, you know, as an ardent neo-Nazi and white nationalist, this is, yeah, this is terrible. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, Jim, uh, it, is, it is, again, great to have you on the show. I have a bunch of questions to ask you. First of all, I'm not going to ask you, again, what the name Mr. Medicare came from because we already know it's a Turkish word. And you've you've kind of picked that up as your title. You originally went with Internet Aristocrat in the past. Why did you switch just, it up? You mean from Internet Aristocrat to Medicare? Or just yeah, from Internet, Aristoc- of- Internet Aristocrat to Medicare. What was the idea behind that? Uh, well, you know, I, I guess with Internet Aristocrat, it kind of ended uh, during Gamergate. So I, I kind of walked away from that identity and just I, it's something I, I've done a lot. Uh, throughout my, I guess, history on the internet. I've had a multitude of accounts where I'd have them open for a year or two. Um, I'd do whatever I'm going to do on them. And then I just walk away for like maybe six months, start a new account and just kind of start over. And I think, honestly, that's the most interesting thing about you because you've been able to go away from many different accounts but still have the same fan base, still have the fans following you. How do you do that? I, I don't know. It is it is a little bit weird. Uh, I'm going to guess maybe the content is, you know, it, it's somewhat the same uh, through each iteration. So, uh, you know, if somebody likes the stuff that I'm doing on one particular channel, the chances are they're going to seek out something similar to it and find it in a search result. And then it's kind of like a game of telephone, I guess, where somebody's like, oh, hey, I ran into this uh, insufferable asshole again <laughs> under, a new, uh, uh, under a new account name. And that's kind of how it happens. But it's just kind of something that I've always done, I guess. I've done it maybe 10, 15 times. So okay. it's just kind of something I've done on YouTube, I guess. I mean, is it kind of like a way to secure yourself from your identity? No, it's just um, I, I always liked kind of having a smaller channel, to be honest. Okay. Um, that would be one of the reasons. I, I didn't like the idea of just having too large of an audience. It makes me feel a little weird. Um, okay. It, it's easier, at least for me, to just have a smaller group of people that watch the stuff because then it, it seems more entertaining. It feels more kind of, it, I, I it guess, feels more like, a, like, a, like a home kind of thing. Well, not even that. It just, it reminds me of kind of the early days of the internet. I mean, back when YouTube first started or you had stage six from Divix, uh, you would run a channel and you'd have a very small group of people that were paying attention to it. Even the, mm-hmm. the larger channels that had a large following, like, you know, hell, like RMAC 21 or something like that. Yeah. It was a big deal back in the early days of YouTube. And I think his largest sub count was maybe 40,000. But I mean, like, that was big back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I, today, that's that's not considered big. Today, 50 million is, you know what I mean, with like PewDiePie or something like that. But it just kind of harkens back to that, to just a smaller kind of feel to it. It was more comfortable and easier to kind of interact with people. And the, one of the issues you run into you get too many people following you and you can't really respond to everybody. And I, it just, it kind of bums me out. I like to be able to talk to people. If they leave a comment, I like to be able to respond. If they send a message, I like to be able to reply if I can. 
You like to be part of the community, which is nice. But the thing about that is that your channel is has blown up. You have 93,000 subscribers, almost to 100,000 subscribers. You have 5 million views on your YouTube. How do you handle that if you want to be such a small community? Oh, well, I, I actually stagger the views. Uh, the views would probably be about double or triple what they are, but I keep deleting videos. So it actually <laughs> knocks the number down. Oh, nice. Mm. Oh, I see that. That's sneaky, Jim. <laughs> that's really <laughs> sneaky. That, that, again, that's something I've always done. Um, and with subscribers, you know, a, a lot of the time, too, is it doesn't even matter really what kind of content you're putting out or what kind of a channel you have. Somebody comes in because they like a particular video, they watch it, and then uh, enough time goes by that you put out another video, they're not even seeing it and the notifications or they don't even remember why the hell they subscribed. So it's just kind of like a, it's a number. It's counted for you, but it's not somebody that's actually actively watching the content. So yeah, I don't really. Yeah, I mean, 93,000. Don't get me wrong. That feels big to me, but um, I don't think that the, that amount of people that are subscribed even are aware the channel's still around because there have been there have been pretty big gaps, you know, four or five months here or there a couple of times where there wasn't any content put on the channel. Jim, I, I think you're you're selling yourself short there because let me tell you something. Whenever there's a, a, a when you had Metacast at least on, on Saturday mornings and uh, and you showed up my app, I, I called up Zach and I was like, Zach, we got to watch this. <laughs> we do. We, we and, would. Uh, me and him I, I, would be I like. I honestly a... think that you know your channel is definitely uh, much bigger. And also, I mean, here's the thing, Jim. I I started off on your internet aristocrat days, so that's kind of how I became a little more known to you. That's kind of how Zach and I and, and Will, of course, over here, who recently got into your channel. And um, and I think with what you try to do is the opposite of what other YouTubers do. Other YouTubers want to get much bigger. Obviously, you want to put out the best content. But at the same time, though, it's not about being uh, out there being uh, big or anything like that. I think for you, it's about quality. Is, is this correct? Well, yeah. I mean, I like to make uh, I, I like to make videos on the subjects that interest me uh, or something that I find entertaining. And if I don't find it entertaining, I'm not going to do it. If I wanted to make money or if I wanted to have a really huge channel. Uh, you know, there it's cyclical on YouTube. There, there are certain cycles that YouTube goes through, where if you ride that kind of wave, if you're on the crest of it, you're going to make a shitload of money. Uh, right now, that would be list videos. Um, I know it sounds stupid, but I've seen people open a channel, uh, and it takes two months, and they've got sixty, seventy thousand subs. Uh, their video view count is ten, twenty million, um, and all they're doing are list videos. I mean, you you could do that if if you wanted to. Um, if I wanted to kind of churn out that kind of content, I, I'd do it, and then I'd reap the rewards of it. Uh, but that's not something I'm interested in. I just want to make videos that I find entertaining, and then if somebody else finds it entertaining, that's great. Yeah, one of your recent videos caused a substantial outcry on the internet, and I'm just wondering what's it like to suddenly feel very overwhelmed, overwhelmingly noticed online. He's talking about the Deviant series, your brand new wonderful series, by the way. Um, I must just, I have to compliment you. Emmy award winning, I would say. <laughs> well, they, or Golden Globe. There we go. Golden yeah. Globe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, Nobel Peace Prize. There, yeah, there we yeah. go. Uh, I'm going to get a Nobel Peace, or a Peace Prize for this. Um, <laughs> you know, the Deviant series kind of reminds me, it, there used to be a website, you, you kind of talking about the Medicare name. There was a website called Medicare that was run by somebody that I knew. Um, and back on that, we had something called Deviant Art Coalition for Quality Control. And this is back maybe five or six years ago. We were writing articles about DeviantArt. Uh, and so it's kind of it's kind of harkening back to that, I guess. Um, but the reaction's interesting. You know, I, I do a couple different videos on these different fetishes or interests on this particular website, <laughs> and it, it created a shitstorm. I mean, people flip, the, pl people flip the fuck out for no <laughs> real discernible reason. Because, you know, I'm, I'm not hunting anybody. That's the weirdest thing. I got a lot of people yelling at me saying, uh, you're going after people. You're going after individuals. You're you're targeting them. All I did in any of those videos was I'd talk about a particular subject, whether it's inflation fetishist or um, <laughs> just just weird <laughs> weird fetishes and shit like that, just for a laugh, just to look at the kind of absurd stuff that's out there. And then uh, to highlight that, I'd show different users and their profiles and their postings. But I never put any personal information up. It was always just whatever the username was. And one of the criticisms I, I got with Deviance and even Tumblrisms or any of the other stuff that I've ever done is, why don't you black out the names? Why don't you, oh, you know, hide the on. usernames? 
<clears throat> well, one, I mean, it's a public posting, but the other thing is some of this stuff is so fucking absurd. If I didn't um, put, if I didn't include the username, if people couldn't actually go and verify it themselves, they'd never believe it was real. <laughs> they'd never believe this kind of stuff. <laughs> That's the truth, though. I, I yeah, honestly right. can't yeah, believe right, yeah. it. <laughs> I can't believe someone's into this shit. It really is disgusting. How about when they? Um, well, I like the legal professionals of uh, the of uh, FA Furry Affinity or whatever who claim that you will be arrested. They're gonna Interpol is <laughs> gonna come right to your house, Jim, and they're gonna walk you away. To yeah, yeah, you're, you're gonna be arrested, Jim. How do you feel? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I've been informed by the fur fag, uh, you know, we, <laughs> that, uh, that I'm in deep shit. Apparently, you, you are. Uh, yeah, uh, because apparently, you know, when you laugh at somebody who gets off on the idea of toddler foxes crapping in diapers, oh. that opens you up for major litigation uh, in the Internet court. <laughs> and so I've been told by this expert team of attorneys at Fur Affinity that I am I am in deep trouble. You are, including in the, with the cyber police, too, I heard. Yeah, well, these people are nuts. Yeah, they wanted me arrested. They wanted to sue me in civil court. They wanted to have criminal charges brought against me. They're talking about shooting me. Oh, uh, God. Because, because I laughed at shit they publicly posted on DA. It's absurd. <laughs> Jim, I, I, this actually segues into a great question because I, 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 was, I actually put the question out there on my Facebook to ask if anybody wanted to ask you a question. And one of the questions that I got back was, what is, you've been because you've been looking at a lot of deviant art fetishes lately. Uh, for your series, what was the one fetish, if there was one, that you would possibly love to try? What do you mean? <laughs> is there one that I actually want to engage in personally? Yes. Is there any one that you would like to engage in personally? Would you ever like want to experiment in one? Well, first, I, like, what have I covered? I covered inflationists. I don't want to shove a bike pump up my ass. That doesn't seem <laughs> really possible to me. Uh, you know, you've got a diaper, diaper fetishist, uh, ABDL, you know, adult baby diaper lovers. I don't want to put on pampers and crap myself. No, that you doesn't don't know. Okay. Would your diaper be, Mr. Jim? Uh, you know, Jim, you know, I'm telling you right now, you can make so much money off a picture of you in diapers. Yeah, I yeah, that's, that's how I want to be. That's how <laughs> I want to be remembered is shitting myself on the Internet. That's a great. <laughs> <laughs> the market is out there. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm sure it is. I, I've run into the market while I'm looking at it. Uh, there are a lot of artists that make a lot of money doing this shit. Uh, but there hasn't been any like uh, any fetish that you've been like, uh, you know, it. it's kind of okay. it's not as bad. It's not as, you know, weird. Maybe maybe, maybe, maybe like to try it. Uh, you know, I, like next week I'm doing giantis, uh, giantism. I don't know what the hell. I don't. Giant women. Uh, I, I don't know if I'd want to. I don't want to get crushed by some skyscraper-sized chick. Uh, <laughs> what else is there? Like cock for? No, I don't want to be eaten by a penis either. So, oh, I, oh my god! I, you know what? What exactly am I going to engage here? Yeah. Oh, I, I, that, that's a, that's another thing too, uh, Jim. Now, obviously, we've NDA, FA, whatever, uh, AF, whatever. Um, there's so many fetishes out there, right? How did you? Like, like come to the order uh, how did you decide to order the fetishes that you're going to tackle because there's a huge array of them and which ones kind of grossed you out the most that you haven't really posted yet uh the reason inflation fetish was the first one i did was because i i found the guy's account where he colored himself like a blueberry uh and inflated himself that was funny oh that was that was the stare i can i tell you something i love that promo you made the new deviant art advertisement <laughs> yeah, because it's just this giant fat guy who's rubbing his tummy because he inflated himself. Like, and there's another one where a guy literally shoves a bike pump up his ass and starts to inflate. So, um, that's that's that shit's funny to me. Like, it it's the humor in the situation. I get it. Everybody has their kink. I get it. Everybody has their fetish. Most people are pretty well adjusted where they can take the joke. Um, but from an outside perspective, like if you're not engaged in that, if you're not interested in it or into it. It's funny to look at. <laughs> it really is. Uh, and that's kind of the approach I take. Is it funny? And if it's funny to me, I'm going to do a video on it. And that's kind of the approach I took. <laughs> and, it, and it's worked out very well for you, honestly. It really has. <laughs> You've put this community up in a roar against you. What has the reaction been like since you've released the fourth episode of Deviance? Uh, well, th that was the interesting part. Um, you know, uh, people on Fur Affinity, on DA, and even on that subreddit, the ABDL one, uh, they all were taking the approach that they all hated Toddler Girl, who was one of the people that was featured in the video. Yeah. Um, and they also didn't like uh, the mentality of that particular group. Uh, they're like, you know, just roll with the punches. Don't get so uptight. Don't file illegal DMCA claims. Um, it's ridiculous. What you know? What the fuck are you doing? So I, I don't know what they're doing, uh, particularly that 
specific group, the group of people I talked about, but I'm sure they're plotting somewhere openly about it, and I'll stumble on it. Uh, they probably put up a fucking Yahoo Answers link. So, <laughs> you know, they're not the, the smartest fucking people on Earth. Well, I mean, think about it. I mean, Jim, they, they're having a pretty rough month. I mean, first Trump becomes president, right? And then uh, now you come back with this video, <laughs> like, well, life is over with. Now I have to go find jobs. Right. I mean, all they wanted to do was relax and watch some YouTube videos while they hid from Mike Pence and his electrocution squad. <laughs> now, now can't Pence, that. take it in the crapper, get it in the zapper, Pence. <laughs> That's right. You can electrocute them all. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just wondering, how, how do you actually do your research for the different videos? That's a great question, actually, because <laughs> I've actually always wondered this, because there's so much out there. How do you even get in contact with all this material? Usually it just starts with the basic search, like uh, the inflation fetish one. I was looking on DA. I found the blueberry guy. I, what I've noticed is uh, whatever the community happens to be, that crazy concentrates itself together. So if you find something that's really absurd, right, um, and then you look at that individual, who they're following, who's following them, the comments that are left, you're going to find even more absurd shit. Uh, in one of the videos, the Vor one, uh, there was a user who was into – planes and cars that were anthropomorphic and alive and like to eat each other and like the amount of crazy shit related to him could be a video in and of itself like it's just <laughs> mind-blowing how these people flock together and they kind of coordinate uh their fetishes together oh, into man. like little little clusters that are kind of secured in a way and that's that's one of the approaches i take now that we've established, you know, that each community kind of has their own breaking point, I guess, or some sculpt culture of some sort. Uh, Jim, we'd like to know what triggers you, like what puts you in a <laughs> in an autistic halt and screech and just what really like uh, triggers you. Jim? Well, obviously, before we continue this, though, I will say this. Uh, you can't use the fact that your audience is too big as an answer. Go ahead. I think the thing that annoys me the most is kind of the and it's more of a modern idea in the last year or two. Um, it's the idea that you can't punch down. I've gotten a lot of these comments and it really does annoy me. Uh, it don't, don't focus on this particular group. Don't focus on this particular individual. You're punching down. You need to go after somebody bigger than you. You can't point and laugh at something that's absurd because, uh, that individual or that group is smaller than your online presence. Um, there's a, a term called troll shielding. <clears throat> and what troll shielding is basically is you find a group of trolls and you befriend them. And because you're friends with these trolls, you'll never be targeted. It's a way of kind of protecting yourself. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a bit of a cold. Okay. I, I, look at, um, I look at punching down as the same way. Uh, when people come to me and they, they complain and say, you can't target these individuals, you're too big to do that, you need to go after somebody bigger than yourself, it, it seems more like what they're saying is, holy shit, if, if you go after this crazy autistic son of a bitch that likes foxes that shit in diapers, <laughs> you're, you're going to find out my crazy shit that I like. So if I stop you here, you won't make it far enough to laugh at me later on. Mm. And so it, it just it really annoys me. It seems like just it seems like bullshit. And I, I just don't buy into the argument. They're acting like I'm, you know, waging some kind of a holy war or they're acting like I need to have some kind of higher purpose on the Internet. I, they're, at the end of the day, they're stupid YouTube videos. So you're, you're making YouTube videos and laughing at dumb shit. There's no great purpose to that. <laughs> You're right. And I'll tell you this. Comedians have had that mentality for years now. Like They've never wanted to not joke about a certain subject just because, oh, we shouldn't touch that. Well, I'll say some comedians. Obviously, Amy Schumer is not a comedian, so I can't really say her. But <laughs> <laughs> No, she's a Canadian now, isn't she? Isn't, didn't she move up there already? Did, I don't think she moved. I think she, she was just saying that she was going to move, and then she... So it's part of her act. Kind of bullshitted her way back to the stage. She's like, oh, I kind of like the state still. You know. What? <laughs> Amy Schumer lied? What? Uh, yeah, right? She lied? Isn't that shocking to you? <laughs> it's shocking. I'm appalled. I can't believe it. She's always struck me as the most honest person on earth. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God. Uh, she's, just, she's just like, um, who's who's that other chick who? who Lena played? Dunham. Lena, thank you. Lena Dunham, who raped her little sister. Oh God! <laughs> charming, charming woman, isn't she? she yeah, she really uh, is. Yeah. Can you do a deviant, Jim? Can you do a deviant episode just on Lena Dunham? Oh God! You know, I haven't gotten to. Uh, I, I haven't gotten <laughs> to. I guess incest yet, but when I do, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gross. We have a, we have a question from Facebook. Um, <laughs> Jim, how big is your dick? 
Uh, it's, you know, you're going to have to leave that to your imagination and just let <laughs> okay. the voice convince you of it says, I get that question all the fucking time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what a guy with a big dick would say. <laughs> it is. It is. Well, d- Jim, do, Jim, do you drive? Because it really matters on what car you drive, you know? That's what I've heard. Do I drive? Yeah, I drive. Okay, what, what do you drive? What, what's your car choice? Is it a small car? I, I drive a Pinto. Pinto. Because I, I yeah, I like explosions. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> With your Firestone tires? Of course. You know, you got to be safe when you're on the road. And so I always load up my Pinto with some Firestones. <laughs> Make sure you watch out for some black ice, right? <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> well, Jim, I, I want to can I can I can I come back in your history a little bit and ask you, you know, about Gamergate because obviously that was such a big, impactful moment of your internet career, as we'll say. Um, you, you know, Gamergate has changed the idea of how we report on on you know different topics and how, you know, Paola and Plugola is a is a big thing in radio broadcasting and in uh, television broadcasting. You expose the fact that this psychotic woman was using using the, using herself as sex to sell her product how do you feel about the effects of gamergate today and you know how the whole journalism community is taking it into consideration now well first you, you need to check your privilege zoe quinn isn't a woman <laughs> she is a man. i don't know if you've heard the announcement oh really zoe... oh, she she had a she had a sex Wait, change. is this true when did I'm this happen no, Zoe has announced that Zoe wants to change from a beautiful butterfly. Oh, boy. well, I am, I am, I am just a xenophobe. I, I am just a, I am just the worst kind of white male there is. You are. You really are. It's terrible how oh. much of a bigot you are for not knowing these facts about important <laughs> on the internet. God, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> with, yeah, with the, with the Quinn thing that really annoyed me, uh, and I think it annoyed a lot of people leading up kind of to Gamergate uh, in the early days and kind of throughout it was the notion that you had a lot of these video game websites that stopped covering gaming as an industry and started injecting opinion pieces into everything. Yeah. And that was obnoxious enough on its own, being told that you as an audience was worthless, that uh, you were somehow at fault, that you know uh, the games you liked were the wrong games to like, that the games you didn't buy should be the ones that you should buy, um, that you were just a terrible person. Overall, you know, we yeah. don't want you as the audience, which is an absurd approach to take to whatever kind of industry you're in. But when you kind of add to that the information about Zoe and kind of this bizarre relationship that, you know, it, it started with uh, her and her boyfriend breaking up. And then the information that he released about how she had all these different industry connections, how she had um, sexual relationships uh, or affairs with different people in different positions, whether they be journalists or developers or people, at pu- you know, publishers, and just kind of the sordid details that were going on behind the scenes. And it made people angry. It made me angry. It made others angry. Yeah. That, you know, we're getting all this crap being told how terrible we are. And then you turn around and these people are just banging each other for press. Uh, yeah. And it just, it, it was annoying. And then you, you find out later on, they've got uh, secret groups where all these different um, websites and, uh, magazines talk to one another mm-hmm. and kind of coordinate what kind of coverage they're going to be put. In. They're not even independent. They're all friends with each other. They all have the same mindset. They all, you know, coordinate their narrative. It's a fucking click, basically. It, it, it is. It's a click that was run by really obnoxious people from San Francisco <laughs> and really <laughs> shitty indie developers. Yeah, and Cupertino. why are they? Yeah, why are they in charge? And you, you'd read stories about different people in the industry that just got into it, artists and graphical designers and stuff like that who felt they couldn't create what they wanted to create because that's too sexist, that's too misogynistic, that's too xenophobic, that's too racist, that's not politically correct enough. Mm-hmm. And it just felt like your hobby was just getting crippled before you. It, it, you know, even kind of past Gamergate now where we are, mm-hmm. you can see this happening in other industries. I mean, Christ, look at comic books. Yeah. Can you can you tell me, are there any white people left in comic books? Is everybody Latino and black <laughs> and transgender? And <laughs> Miles Morales. <laughs> right? Like, every, like Captain right. America, Iron Man, uh, Thor, none of them are, like, there's no white dudes left anymore because everybody has been, you know, put through the PC kaleidoscope. And come out a different color and gender and orientation and religion and yeah. and uh, because they were told that's what makes the product good, yeah. and what they're finding out is that's not what make the pro- uh, that's not what makes the product good. What makes the product good is a compelling story, an interesting character, good you know development that kind of stuff. And if they happen to be gay or Muslim or whatever, fine, that's great. But that's secondary to the core purpose of what your product is, which is a fucking good story. 
Yeah. Um, and it felt like that was happening in gaming. So you just you had this corrupt group of people that all knew each other, fucked each other, did, uh, <laughs> did financial agreements with one another, and they were telling you you were shit because you weren't buying their terrible indie crappy fucking product. Yeah. And that was infuriating. So kind of watching that grow up and kind of explode. And then even on the tail end of that, you know, as Gamer, Gamergate kind of uh, quietly died down, uh, and, you know, not that it's dead or anything, but mm-hmm. that it, you know, it wasn't as big as it was. It's it's kind of run its course. You it had has. stuff like um, you had stuff like Thiel and Hogan going after Gawker and completely crushing Nick Denton because of their journalistic practices. And, you know, Gawker was one of the places that had that started this off with Kotaku. I mean, that's where Grayson worked and he had the relationship with Zoe Quinn. Mm-hmm. So watching that kind of implode on itself was really a great capstone, I think. And I don't, want, the, I, don't, I don't want to come off with this opinion here because I don't want you to have your own opinion because of my opinion. But I feel like uh, Gamergate, with the situation that happened there, it's kind of the same situation we're seeing now with the presidency and with the media. Would you agree? Uh, I think what you're you're seeing right now take place is Trump was – when he was running, everybody thought it was, oh, this is great. You know, we're going to get a few punchlines out of this. This guy's a joke. He's done it before. Nobody really takes it seriously. Mm-hmm. Then he started to get support, and they got a little bit worried. But they're like, it's not a big deal. He'll he'll get destroyed in the primaries. We're going to have Jeb or something, you know, with his little block. <laughs> I, I know you voted for Jeb. I'm so sorry he didn't win, by the way. I, I know. It's so sad that Jeb did not win. I'm really sorry about it. Did you get your guac bowl, though? Oh, God, no. You know, I, I ordered a guac bowl and all that showed up was a box full of blood and tears. So I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's probably not good. That is not good. <laughs> it is similar. I, I would agree with you. It, it is similar in some regards. You've got a group of media uh, personalities and organizations that talk mm-hmm. to each other. Uh, yeah. We saw some of that with the Podesta email leaks that came through WikiLeaks showing, you know, CNN talking to people in the DNC. Um, you had different uh, journalists kind of coordinating to shit on Trump or a uh, narrative getting pushed forward. I mean, hell, uh, what is it? Rachel Maddow on MSNBC when Trump, you know, he'd won. He decided to go get a steak right at a restaurant. Didn't tell anybody. Just just went with his security detail and a few people had a steak. Well, Rachel Maddow puts a program up saying this is the most horrible thing that's ever happened. How dare Trump go to eat dinner without telling us? <laughs> yeah. he his, and she used the phrase protective press pool. Oh, to God. go out and eat like these people would ever take a bullet for anybody. Like, what is that? What is a protective press pool? Is Rachel Maddow going to jump in front of a sniper bullet to protect Donald <laughs> Trump? <with> the <laughs> <laughs> I can't even follow it up with that. Everything was so brilliantly said. Um, <laughs> it was. <laughs> well, going, <laughs> I know. Well, going back to uh, uh, what you said about superheroes. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're taking core characters, core flagship Marvel characters, and to some extent DC characters, and they're basically changing it up. It's not like they're creating... See, this is the real quote-unquote racist stuff here, is that they're not creating original superheroes who could be Muslim, black, etc., etc. What they're doing is that they're taking properties and they're switching around, kind of like gender bending, well, which they have also done too. But, uh, Jim, all I can say is that it's not to worry because they haven't made the Asian Bruce Wayne yet. So once they make that, we're going to be sad. No, but they, they, they did make the Asian Incredible Hulk. They did. They did. Yeah. Did they yeah, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I actually didn't know yeah. that. He's like, oh, I, just, I mean, yeah, what is that's it? Emb- an Asian Incredible, uh, Asian Incredible Hulk, uh, Muslim Miss Marvel. Uh, <laughs> that's embarrassing. Are you Iron, serious? Yeah, black female Iron Man. Yeah. Um, a black male Captain America. Ugh, uh, I don't Spider Man right now. What race and ethnicity are we on with Spider Man? Spider Man's got to be like, Arab. He has to be. They can't black or something <laughs> like that. Like hybrid. Like, well, not hybrid. I'm sorry. Biracial. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you slipped up a little bit there. Whoa. Yeah. That was Excuse embarrassing. <laughs> uh, well, technically, he is a hybrid. He got bit by the spider. So he's a <laughs> nice recovery. Yeah, that worked really well. <laughs> nice recovery. <laughs> Jim, can I go back on something you said before? You were talking about Podesta and um, and uh, his scandal. Can I ask you the honest question? Do you believe in Pizzagate? Do I believe that there is a secret pedophile ring run out of the basement of a pizzeria in Washington? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do I think that these individuals maybe have code words and that there's some kind of sex trafficking going on with people in politics and people in Hollywood and people with money? Yeah, I, I, I would almost guarantee it. Okay. Uh, people with political power and wealth usually are involved in some very heinous, corrupt shit. I mean, we've seen that play itself out in multiple governments throughout history. Uh, some weird stuff in the Podesta emails. Uh, you know, I can't discount it. 
but I, I'm not really abreast on Pizzagate. I can't tell you is it real or is it not. Uh, but I will say that of all the journalists that have tried to cover it, you know, the majority just laughed at it and said, this is complete bullshit. Uh, you're all psychotic. Why are you even paying attention to this? And got, I feel terrible because I can't remember his name. I think he works for CBS or NBC, some kind of local. Mm -hmm. uh, but one, one guy did a TV broadcast about it and actually covered it. And he didn't come out and say it's bullshit or it's true. He simply came out and said, OK, this is this is what we're looking at. You know, these are the symbols involved. These are the people involved. Uh, these are the locations involved. And some of this stuff is really weird. You know, I, I, I've seen some of the stuff people have talked about where, uh, what is it, Elefante, uh, whatever the guy's name, I can't. You know, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. He was, he was the owner of the, of, uh, what was it? Uh, Comet Ping Pong. Comet Ping Pong, yes. Right. So he was the owner of the the, the restaurant in, in an interview when people were saying, well, people are claiming that you have children in the basement or that some illicit activity is going on down there. He said, we don't even have a basement here. And yet in a previous mm -hmm. news article where they had talked to him, he talked about how he stored all his tomatoes and his ingredients in the basement. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's stuff like that that makes you go, okay, that's kind of that's kind of a little bit weird. Why, yeah. you know, the FBI releases this report talking about all these uh, pedophile symbols, and they're all related to Comet Ping Pong and Besta Pizzeria, and they're all using these symbols. So, yeah, I admit it's really bizarre. Mm -hmm. It's super bizarre, but I, I, I can't. I can't give you a definitive answer one way or another, but I like the shitstorm. It's fucking entertaining from my perspective. So <laughs> it is. You like you like that um that, that juicy stuff that like just goes out and everybody gets going oh, crazy I, about. I love, I love chaos. That's part of the reason why I love Trump so much. I love watching people flip out. I love the chaos of them not being able to really handle the situation that's unfolding. So, so and Trump is great for that. So it's fair to say that you're a Trump supporter. Um, well, you know, I'll say what I said on the Meadowcast. I, I didn't vote for him because I had uh, some objections to some of the planks that he had in his platform related to freedom of expression, you know, kind of First Amendment stuff with the press. Mm -hmm. And my main thing was the NSA. I didn't like uh, programs like the prison program that, you know, uh, different uh, bills that got passed under both Bush and Obama. I, th I felt we were kind of getting stripped of our rights. And his approach, or at least the answers that he'd given at the time, were he wasn't going to rescind them or reverse them. He liked them, and he maybe even would expand on them. And so for me, I just couldn't go along with that. But as far as you know, all the candidates that were available from all the parties, yeah, I like Trump the most. I like, I like how he just gets out there. I like he speaks his mind, mm -hmm. and I love the chaos that unfolds because of him. I, I didn't vote this election. I'm one of those horrible fucking lazy bastards. Really. That has a fence post up his ass because he's straddling that motherfucker. You but, uh, and, and maybe, maybe I, and too many people will probably see you too. That's the problem too. Well, no, and <laughs> you know the other thing too is I said this back in God, it must have been September, uh, not last year, the year before. I mean, this was right when Trump was getting into it uh, that I was almost certain he was going to win, and yeah. I was certain he was going to win because I felt like he captured lightning. I, I felt like he was getting the support of individuals that were just sort of kind of ready that they were in a rebellious mood. It wasn't, it, w it went beyond like the tea party stuff. It went into almost the, we just don't fucking care anymore. We're sick of the establishment as it exists. We're sick of the corruption as it exists. And we want to see somebody go in there and just fuck it all up, <laughs> you know, target, target the people that we don't like. And I know Trump, uh, you know, he, he'd made some statements about draining the swamp and a lot of people have problems with the people that he's appointed to positions because of the connections they have with different companies and corporations. Mm -hmm. But you have to admit, Trump got in there and he did a lot of the shit he said he was going to do. He did. I mean, this guy's working fast through a lot of his promises and his executive orders. And I don't even think it's, it's been it's been like 30 – it hasn't even been 30 days. Yeah, it's ridiculous. He's worked faster than any president I can honestly remember. It's really stunning to see how quickly he's moving through. And I like how the news reports, you know, at first when he – took office mm. we're like he'll never keep his promises you know trump is trump is going to disappoint everybody and now they're all upset is he obsessed why is trump obsessed with keeping his promises like make your mind up do you want yeah. him not to do them or do you want him to do them no doubt and uh you know I, i'll be honest with you I, I didn't even think he would do um one tenth of what he would do at least un until like maybe in the third month in but he's moving so fast and i and i'm wondering if that's just because that's how he works um at a uh what's this company called Trump or whatever. <laughs> um, but the one question, I'm sorry, I have a list here, so I'm just a little distracted right now. I kind of wanted to jump topics a little bit because, um, you know, the one thing that I notice about you and I, and this is what I think, Jim, and maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, I think that you do have a career, right? I think you're currently in a, in some sort of a position, right? And I think the question I'm going to ask is that if you were to switch careers, right? If you were to teach a subject at a high school, 
what would it be? And lunch is not an answer. <laughs> if I if I were to go into high school education, what subject would I want? I'd probably go with history or social studies. Which yeah, pretty much are the same thing. Let's be honest. You know what I mean? They kind of bounce back and forth, but um, that's kind of the interest that I would have. I, I would think I'm not great at science and I'm not great at math, so I'd be fucking horrible as your teacher. <laughs> with those subjects. So if I if I had to go with one, social studies, civics, or history. You couldn't see yourself teaching gym? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> not not to be I, ironic. <laughs> no, I, I would be I would be the guy that would let just kids fuck off all day. You know, like I'd be like, whatever. You're in high school. This at this point, you can do whatever the fuck you want. I'm gonna go have a cigarette, run some. I don't you know. Play some shooty hoops. Shooty hoops. Shoot <laughs> okay, so do your sport thing. I'm gonna go just have a smoke. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Jim, um, speaking of smoke, because you smoke a lot, I know. I would have, from what I've heard, I don't know for a fact. Do you smoke a lot? Uh yeah. I mean, you know, your typical average smoker. You know, I smoke camels. <laughs> It'll bite me in the ass one day, but you know, I'm well aware of it. <laughs> I, I'm trying to get to know Jim more. I don't think from all these interviews that I've seen online, people don't usually get into the mindset of Jim, and it bothers me because I want to know more about the guy who's behind the microphone. You know, I, I'm. I'm the most average person you could imagine. If I was walking down the street, you'd be, I'd be like background noise. Like I, I'm, I'm just another face in the crowd kind of guy. Oh, you see, know, see, cause, cause I thought you would be the guy with the, with the face makeup and you know, the eyeliner. Yeah, a giant white aristocrat wig as I strut down the street. I, I'm sorry, Jim. Can I just cut in and say that when I first like saw your videos, I really thought like whenever you set this whole thing up when you're writing, I actually really did envision you in like your wig, <laughs> like a blue gown, <laughs> and just go ahead and just you know making your videos as you go along as the internet aristocrat. Yeah, the, the internet aristocrat. The channel started as a joke. Uh, you know who uh, Gilbert Godfrey is? Yes. Uh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, he, he's got a joke, the aristocrats, which yes. is, ba you know, it's a it's a punchline where it starts off tame and it ends tame, but in the middle is the most horrendous shit you can imagine. And so that was the whole point of the Internet Aristocrat. I did videos where the the beginning would be very tame, the ending would be very tame, but then the middle content would be just fucking crazy. And that's why it's called an Internet Aristocrat. Uh, the only reason I changed it later on is I started doing Tumblrisms, and for some reason all these people on Tumblr thought I thought – like I had this self-image that I was important and I was a real aristocrat. So I was like, well, I'll fuck with them. <laughs> oh, boy. And I'll, I'll find a picture of it and go with it. So that's that's where that came from. <laughs> that is the most sick joke, by the way, I will say. It's one of the it's it is one of the most it's there's no comedy to it. It's dark comedy. And I think that really wraps around the idea of what your whole channel is supposed to be. It's kind of well, right. dark yeah, comedy. I, I, I like I like the I, I can't really say the early days of the internet because then we'd be talking like bulletin boards and we're nurse, talking, or we'd be talking AOL and shit yeah 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 I I, I guess <laughs> and docs kind of, <laughs> like very late nineties to kind of mid two thousands okay right that's you know kind of right uh, yeah so basically it, it starts almost at the beginning of something awful and then kind of ends near the beginning of four chan um, <laughs> that, that seemed like that seemed like a really good kind of sweet spot where people. <laughs> we're having enough fun fucking with each other and laughing at really stupid shit, and nobody was super hypersensitive about it. There wasn't a huge social media presence, um, and it was just fun. You yeah. know, like I feel like the internet's not fun anymore. Everybody's so up their own ass. It's really bizarre. Like you can't joke about certain things anymore. Even no. YouTube. Like you, there there are certain things that are forbidden now on YouTube that uh, in the early days you could do and nobody would have given a shit. Uh, and I think that's kind of what you're seeing going on with PewDiePie, uh, which I think is funny as shit, is he's kind of pointing that out with his recent videos kind of mocking all these news organizations and uh, different YouTubers that are getting upset with him making jokes mm -hmm. uh, and being hypersensitive about it. Because really, again, at the end of the day, what is it? It's some dude on an Internet website making 10 minute video. You know, like what? How is that important? Why are we fighting over this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Jim, you, you've created such Con such breakthrough content, I should say. Where do you get the ideas from? Where does well, it come it, from? It, it's all the same stuff, really, at the end of the day. It's it's looking at a retarded group of people on the internet and laughing at how retarded they are. <laughs> it's, it may be put on a different uh, heading, you know, it may be grouped onto something like a specific <laughs> website or a different group, but at the end of the day, it really is just laughing at stupid shit on the internet. Uh, <laughs> that's what I find the most entertaining. Uh, and then I, I, I think that's what people who watch them, mm -hmm. uh, watch the videos, find entertaining too. Um, 
You know, there, I a lot of my videos too, kind of early on, were dealt with like a lot of the SJW stuff. You know, social justice warriors that yeah. kind of led into the GamerGate thing. Um, I, I've kind of pulled away from that. Not that I find that those people aren't obnoxious as shit, or that I don't think they're a problem <laughs> anymore. But it, like everybody's doing it now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I. I feel like, okay, well, you know, it's kind of covered, so what am I going to do? I'm just going to go back to the shit that I really enjoyed, which is just mocking stupid shit on the internet. That's yeah. kind of why I transitioned back into into Deviance. Speaking of the YouTube channel itself, you're about to cross 100,000 subscribers. It's a massive milestone. I think the current live count is 93,836. He's a big statistic guy, by the way, I should say. He's a yeah. <laughs> big statistic guy. But go ahead. Oh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, it, means, it means that basically the silver play button. Uh, what's, what does that mean to you? Uh, nothing. I'm just going to put in uh, the address for a homeless shelter and a fake name so they can sell it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> so, yeah, so but, I mean, what, what is a what homeless is that, what is a homeless kid going to do with a with a silver play button to you? I don't, I don't know. See, that's funny to me though. <laughs> exactly. What are they, they'll probably pawn it off for a couple bucks and get some liquor. Send it but, to a Syrian refugee shelter. <laughs> oh <laughs> I mean, my god! Like, really? What what does that mean to me? It means nothing. You know, it, it, ten years from now, what am I going to say to somebody when they look at the wall and say, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> well, I was I was a semi big deal on YouTube. What the fuck is YouTube? <laughs> I, I used to talk into a microphone for 20 minutes about people shitting into diapers. So that's the point I got. I, 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 you brought up the diaper thing a lot. I feel like the diaper thing has scarred you. <laughs> well, I, I think that, you know, and, and again, this kind of goes back to to the cycles of the internet itself. But um, there, there are a lot of groups out there that are really weird and that yeah. people would kind of want to add and have a laugh about that kind of fell out of favor because other things got focused on more. Yeah. Um, and now if you go back and talk about it, people get really pissed off because they're like, dude, we've been so under the radar for so long. Why are you doing this? <laughs> yeah. And it, it's funny. Like, yeah, you want to you want to pretend you're a four year old fox and shit in diapers. That is fucking funny to me. I don't know <laughs> why you're surprised by that. <laughs> I mean, you're right. It, it is very fucked up. There is no no going about it. There really isn't. And the fact that not many people know about it and you're bringing it into the limelight is is great. It really is. It's a great deal of because com- people don't know where these areas of comedy are, and you're finding them, and you're exposing them. And this is, I guess, this is just the the originality of you. You're you're you are able to take these topics that are just so bizarre and bring them out into the light, and in such a way that it's entertaining to watch throughout even a, a, th- a 25 minute video. Yeah, I mean, there's certain stuff, too, that I like to talk about that's not, I guess, comedy-focused or that I would find entertaining. Like, I've done videos on somebody like Nick Bates. uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, who is the the convicted pedophile that was into corpophilia. I mean, his legal strategy, and this, you know, this is funny, but he thought he could get off the charges for pedophilia by masturbating on camera while smearing himself and shit. Oh, yeah, I I, I did read this on uh, on Encyclopedia Dramatica, but go ahead. (laughs) Right, and that's insane. So, you know, I did a video on that because I found it interesting. Mm -hmm. I've done videos on stuff like, uh, I can't even remember his name anymore, uh, Howard something, but the dentist who would... uh, perform procedures on kids without any anesthetic oh money. yeah we, we did it we did talk about that on the show here before stuff like that occasionally gets my interest and i'll, I'll cover it or i'll do like a one-off uh like the we was kings thing uh for <laughs> <laughs> where did you find that photo <laughs> <laughs> that is where did you find that photo <laughs> uh which one the das right one or which the, the one, one that one the one you changed your photo to that like you you were now king of uh of of um what was it africa oh. or something yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that was just a, it. That floated around for a while as part of kind of a joke related to it, and then I just I threw it on there because I thought it was funny. But um, yeah, that group, the, the, like that's that's so fucking crazy. Like you you hear a lot of people um, make jokes about Nazis and white supremacists, but you yeah. don't really ever hear about black supremacy. You don't really hear about like the black Israelites and groups like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, and yeah. they are fucking insane. They are like they are just crazy. Like the whole. We were created by a big-headed scientist, and white people lived in cave shit. Like it's <laughs> insane. Jim, I live so, in New York. I see that all the time. <laughs> yeah, Brooklyn I, but, especially. You'll find them in the the trees. But a, anybody outside of like the Northeast, right, isn't going to know who the fuck those people You're are. Right. Like they've never heard of it. Um, <laughs> and like, it's just so crazy. Like seeing a black guy wearing a Star of David, yelling at a Jew, telling him the Holocaust didn't happen, is bonkers. <laughs> And he's like, we're the real Jews. You're not really a Jew. And the Holocaust didn't happen. And then he goes, we're glad it happened. He just wanted to be <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> oh man. Uh, I'll just say this though. My uh my favorite um Medicare streams are the ones where <laughs> whenever uh, uh there's like an anti police protest happening in the, the inner cities and people just wanna you know, hey, you know, just wanna just let their voices be heard and they're burning it down and you do these streams and what's so crazy is that you're not really like you know quote unquote let's say exposing like the, uh, all of them but what you're doing is that it's you're just showing these channels and you say okay <laughs> this is what's happening so that's uh that's good stuff and it's funny i love your color commentary like what you said something like um the coffins filled with chicken wings or grape juice or something like that. I don't know what oh yeah, is. yeah. At the uh, justice for yeah. So in Minnesota, there was uh, a guy, Jamar Clark, I think it was, that uh, basically got shot by cops, and they were trying to say that he was handcuffed. The cops threw him on the ground and shot him in the back of the head because they hate black people. Yeah. Turns out he's got a criminal record. He's a liar, and the reason the cops were there was he was beating his girlfriend, and uh, you know they he went after the cops, but they were having protests in relation to this, and. Uh, God, was it Jamar? There's so many of them, I, I lose track. But basically, it was somebody talking about <laughs> yeah, <I know>. <laughs> somebody <laughs> talked about the victim and saying that you know his friend Little Chicken Wang was coming down. Oh <laughs> my God, yes, I remember this. <laughs> That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just it's it's crazy shit. Uh, what really surprises me about a lot of these like protests, I, I even saw this yesterday at the Portland airport. Oh, there's yeah. a video about this. You you get all these groups that go out and they're like. The news covers it, and they say how there are these peaceful protests and how these these people are so upstanding and nothing bad happened. Mm -hmm. But you watch the live streams, and they're always attacking the cops. They're always throwing fireworks at them. They're chucking bricks and rebar off of bridge overpasses on their heads. <laughs> um, in Portland at the airport, they found they, the group of uh, protesters chased a guy down and beat him in an airport, spit on him, screamed Nazi at him, and were laughing about it. Yeah. And then and then after that, I swear to God, within thirty seconds, they start chanting peaceful protest. And you never hear about that on the mainstream media, and that blows my mind. Why aren't you covering that? Like Jamar Clark, the same thing happened there. They said these were peaceful protests, but then you watch the actual live coverage of them going on. They're throwing Molotov cocktails. They're they're popping yeah. cart tires. They're blocking off uh, interstates. They're attacking people. They're attacking cops. They're defacing property. And it it's just amazing if you watch it live while it's happening, you get a better idea of what's really going on. It's it's really absolutely. It, it really is disgusting though the way they act. And the way they they think they're they're doing good for the community when they're breaking down a Starbucks or they're uh, they're looting a uh, a police car. Yeah, that, that makes no sense to me. If if you're a, a member of the black community and there's some some injustice you think that's happened, how is burning down your local neighborhood going to help you? No. Like you're hurting store owners that live in your neighborhood. These are black owned businesses, so you're not hurting the man. You're not going to the governor's mansion. You're not going to the police station. You're burning down a McDonald's and a gas station and a Starbucks owned by some dude who works his ass off to try to support his family. Like, what are you doing? We need our community. You know, that, that whole thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it just, we it's, need it's, our we. <laughs> <laughs> Go burn the suburbs. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That was the sister. That was the sister. One of the uh, one of the people that they were saying was a victim of injustice. She was like, yeah. I need my hair weaves and I smoke my marijuana. Go burn the suburbs down. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Oh, Jim, this, a lot of your ideology is kind of very conservative. So some people would say, do you consider yourself a, cons a conservative, a Republican, more, more Republican, or do you consider yourself more liberal? Or do you still I, consider I, yourself in the middle? Because I personally am in the middle. I, I'm, I'm an independent. So uh, Usually what I just tell them is I'm a constitutionalist and that just uh, they don't know what the fuck that means. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I, I typically lean right, I, I, at least – as far as economy goes, like yeah. I like conservative policies when it comes to kind of economics. Okay. Um, my approach to civil liberties, like when you're talking about freedom of expression and stuff, I, mm. I think everybody should be protected equally under the Constitution. I think that's a pretty basic idea. Um, and my notion as far as individuals and how they behave is if you have a sense of humor, I'm probably going to get along with you. I don't, you know, it, people bring this up with uh, transsexuality, right? They're like, what's your opinion on that? Like, well, I think it's crazy personally, but I'm not going to, I don't give a shit what you do to your own body. It'd be like me going up to some guy with tattoos and saying, Hey, what the fuck do you think you're doing? Like I, it's your body, man. If you want to do shit to it, knock yourself out. I'm, I'm pretty hands off when it comes to personal civil liberties. Mm -hmm. uh, m most of my politics comes from a national level, ec uh, you know, economy, uh, security and things of that nature. So would you say you're yeah. kind of, you're kind of like with me when, when it comes to abortion, where it's like let the girl decide or are you the opposite? Um, I, I don't think I, I 
like uh, obviously that's a harder question to ask. I mean, it's not just a yes or no question there. That that, that has a lot of a lot of background to it. But I mean, I, that's how I'm feeling from your idea well, yeah. of if, politics. If I put it like this, I, I'd say you know I've done fucked up shit in my life. I'm not the best person on earth, so I'm probably yeah. not the moral authority on what a woman should be doing. At the same time. <laughs> At the same time, I don't think that I should be financing it either. Okay. You know, I know like one of the big arguments when it comes to abortion is, okay, if you want to give, uh, you know, if you want to be pro-choice, fine, but why am I financing it? And then the counter argument to that is, well, they give men Viagra pills. Well, okay, don't give men Viagra pills. I don't give a shit. So guys <laughs> don't have boners and I'm not paying for you to get babies scraped out of your stomach. Like, oh, you know, my God. <laughs> <laughs> graphic Jim, graphic. <laughs> we know well, you're a uh, visualist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jesus Christ! All right. Well, anyway, to um to kind of like get like the uh, the real idea of you, Jim. Right? I know that uh um in a few like in a long, stream from a long time ago, I think you said in a Q and A that one of your favorite, or at least your favorite Final Fantasy was was Tactics. Which I'll have to agree, Tactics and Six are my uh, top uh, top because uh, I feel like there's no other combat game that's very similar to tactics and um i was wondering if you got a chance to play final fantasy final fantasy 15 what were your thoughts on it do you feel it's gotten a little more weebunized like is it the same that you'd expect from squeenix i got so much shit for posting my i, I went out and rented it apparently you can still rent games like if you go to red <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a joke, joke. <laughs> are you serious I, I, uh, I no no i went and rented it at Redbox for like two bucks and i think next I you're gonna like... tell me Bo- blockbuster's fucking on-demand service is still around <laughs> I, I know right it's crazy but i i felt like i overpaid for the two bucks to be honest like i i hated 15 i fucking hate yeah, it i agree with you it was too like uh i mean not j- just the fact that it's from a, a dv's departure from the whatever it, it it came to be basically what final fantasy 15 was is that it was just a it was like a J-Rock band tour. Like it, it was like, I don't know, Jim. Like I, I really can't put my finger on it, but it was it was I wasn't into it. I didn't even finish it. I went up to chapter three, and that's as far as I made it. And that was it, it. it felt schizophrenic to me. Like I started okay, so you start the game and what do you get? You get like uh maybe a half a minute, maybe thirty seconds to forty five seconds of a cutscene where the king is like, Okay, get in your car and go on a gay road trip. And then, <laughs> what am I doing? Why am I going why am I driving out of the desert? Like what the fuck you get more story elements from the loading screens than you did from that cutscene. <laughs> <laughs> you go off into the desert and you're ca- here, explain this to me. You're the fucking prince of a kingdom, right? Uh, am I so you're you're Prince Noctis or whatever. You're you're supposed to be rich. You've got a fancy car, but your fucking car breaks down after five minutes. <laughs> you, can't, you can't call your dad and be like, "Send me another car." <laughs> so you sleep at a gas station, and this this hillbilly chick is like, "Y'all want to go kill some shit?" So you're like, "Yeah, why not?" I'm wearing pure fucking leather. Let me run out in the fucking sun. For- oh, God. <laughs> you go kill some shit. You come back. You get your car fixed. And you're like, "Okay, all right, whatever." So this is where the game really starts. And then what do you find out? The fucking car is on rails. You built an entire game around the notion of free travel, and the fucking car is stuck on the road. Basically, it's hold the button to go. I, that's where I, I put the control down, and I was like, fuck this, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. And, and, you, and, you know, I, I was saying to myself, wow, you know, it took like, it was a decade, it was 10 years. And that's not just uh, including the hiatuses that's in between. I mean, this really took 10 years from concept to execution. <laughs> I mean, this game, was, it would start it off as a, you know, it was supposed to be for last gen consoles, and you can kind of tell that it was pretty uh, uh it was kind of outdated a little bit the environments are really bland and when you go play in the game yeah you say to yourself what the hell what the hell is this this is a waste of my time and jim jim i'm not gonna yeah. i'm not gonna yeah. even ask you what you thought of no man's sky because clearly we know your opinion <laughs> yeah I, I i that shit i i got pulled into a stream with the developer uh dino dan or what the, i don't know the fuck oh did you is, really but... get did you actually talk to him no, I, I didn't talk to Sean Murray. I talked oh, okay. to another developer, a guy that makes makes video games, and he was upset uh-huh. that I was making fun of Sean Murray. And I got into this conversation with him, which is funny. I don't know if, you know, I'm not going to tell you to go watch it because I'm not, like, that feels weird to say, but mm-hmm. it, there's a portion of it where I'm talking to him, and basically his argument is, well, making video games is special. There's no other, there's no other industry like it that exists. We're special individuals, and you need to basically believe and trust in us. I know he's just delusional shit because Sean Murray is this shit heel that lied to people and basically mm-hmm. hoodwinked him. 
Yeah. Um, but he, he, I was like, well, who do you blame then for this kind of stuff? And he actually says the publishers are the people that are the problem. And I kid you not, within like two minutes of him saying that, he gets a phone call and he answers it on stream and he goes, oh, can you hold on for a second? It's my publisher. Oh, so I, he got, I, think he got, I, I think he got yelled at from, I think it was Sony or whoever the fuck it is, for actually saying that they were the assholes ruining video games. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Holy shit! I mean, Jim. I mean, what, what kind of what is what is what is a game that intrigues you? I, I just like I will play shit that people. I I play video games that I know are terrible, but I have fun with them. Uh, okay. I like Ace of Spades, fucking horrible video game. There's nobody playing it, but I put like 600 goddamn hours into it. I like <laughs> games that have multiplayer. Um, I used to be really big into single player RPGs, but I I feel like that age is kind of past. Are you a GTA guy? Um, like the the. I'm sorry, my what? A GTA guy. Uh, Grand no. Theft Auto. San Andreas was kind of where my love affair with GTA kind of died out. I didn't like uh four, five was okay. Okay. You know, like I didn't have problems with it, but um, San Andreas I think was kind of like the swan song for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I just I, I I don't know. I like games where I can kind of jump in, play with other people, and get lost in it. Um. Like Ace of Spades, uh, this is crazy, but the m- typical match length in one of those, like classic Capture the Flag, is an hour and a half long. Oh, God. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So you know my autism is heavy. So maybe not <laughs> <laughs> opinions on video games. But yeah, 15, 15 was terrible. They should have called it Final Fantasy Forever because it was a fucking Duke Nuke. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, as long as you're able to hide your autism, that's that's what I've learned from your last video. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the crazy thing is, like, I kept like, people kept saying, like, oh, it's going to be kind of like 12 was, you know, you're going to be able to run in this open world and encounter monsters and have these random battles. And it's going to be great because, you know, it's going to be structured like that. And then all I remember before I got in my gay little car that only goes straight was <laughs> you, I ran into like, four enemies. Like I'm running around the place and I was like, where the fuck are the bad guys? Like, what What the fuck is going on here? Yeah, and I, I think they uh, all put uh, Tetsuya Nomura on, like, this big pedestal, and I don't discredit the man for being, a, you know, a game developer, but, you know, the, the whole direction between 13 and then 15, of course, the online series, which I feel, in my opinion, they should not be in uh, numerical or anything like that, because Final Fantasy has always been at its core, like, a, a single-player RPG that you enjoy. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it was... You know, 10, you know, all right, it's whatever. Uh, 12, I, I appreciate it for what it was. My, I, I love 9. I mean, I started off in the PS1 days. I'm a millennial, so what the hell. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, then I went backwards, like 6 and all that stuff, and then Tactics, of course. Um, and, you know, those were some of my favorites. And, and that kind of era of RPG, I think that, that kind of golden age really got lost and i'm not just talking about those rpgs i'm talking like old school fallout and fallout 2 where you know decisions actually matter in games etc cetera, etc cetera. and now when they market these hey you're, you're gonna make these great choices and everything like that it's really not what it's promised i i didn't enjoy fallout 4 um metal gear solid 5 even you know that that wasn't i wasn't even a big fan of that you know will I, i'm gonna let me ask you what will what was your what's your game of choice right now my game of choice right now yeah it's actually it's actually a Facebook game, believe it or not. Oh, fuck you. All right. Anyway. No, it, it, <laughs> <laughs> you turned into a prison architect for a while from uh, what yeah, I remember. Yeah, prison architect yeah. was the last game I played on PC. <laughs> Are you more of a PC gamer, uh, Mr. Mediger? Uh Yeah, I used to be really big into consoles, but I feel like that age kind of died off around the PS3, to be uh. honest. Like, three, 360 had a, a decent, decent assortment, but, like, my golden age, I, I guess. And don't get me wrong, like, NES and Sega... Uh, the Genesis, that kind of stuff. They all had really great games, but I think the golden age was kind of like PS1 and PS2, like those libraries combined. Yeah. I had some of the greatest, like you had stuff that was like just niche stuff that was really good, like the Dot .hack series. You had stuff oh, uh, yes. like uh, Valkyrie Profile and uh, Xenogears and Legend of Ligaia and Legend of Dragoon. And you just, you had these games that were really, really grandia, like these great games that are never going to be made in this day and age. Um, and when you put those libraries together, you've got some real gems to choose from. Uh, after kind of like PS3, 360 era, I got into PC gaming and I've really enjoyed it because I got to look at like the back catalog of the PC stuff that I never had a chance to get into, uh, like Planescape Torment and stuff like that. A lot of the D&D games. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm mostly a PC guy now, to be honest. Nice. Do you, did you mod your computer or anything like that? Or you have the shittiest computer ever, I'm guessing? Um, I, I had my previous computer died. Uh, and I, thought I, I heard was that. Be gone. Yes. Yeah, I, I thought I was going to be gone for a long time. Um, my girlfriend ended up surprising me, and she bought me like components to fix it. So I, I got. Oh better, yeah, how, how is the a, is the Asian girl right? 
Yeah, that's right. The Asian girl, the one in the orange. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How is she, by the way? I forgot to ask in the beginning. Uh, you know, she's okay when I let her in the house, but it's hard for her to get through the doggy door. Oh, my God. Um, oh, God. <laughs> oh man. Did you have any dinner, Mr. Jim? What's going on? No, no. Uh, she, she's doing fine. Um, but, yeah, yeah, she she picked out the components and stuff, and um, computer up and running. And it's got a better graphics card now, so I can actually play some of the stuff that I couldn't before. So I'm, I've been having fun with that. Like, uh, you know, Recently, I've been playing uh, Resident Evil 7. So oh right. my god, Jim, I just finished it. It's it's amazing. I actually liked it. It's a step back to the well, what I mean a step back, I mean in a positive way. Like it it, it goes back to what it's meant to be. And now not enough enemies, but hey, whatever. It's it's at least getting there. <laughs> Don't spoil it. <laughs> right, Jim, did you beat it yet or no? No, I'm only about an hour into it. Oh, um, all I, right, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm I'm only, even... I've only been able to play a little bit of it. I, I you know, I, I, I don't know yet. I, I do like it. I think it's got a really fucking great atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, it sets the mood really, really well, but I haven't really gotten into like a lot of combat, and I haven't really gotten into, uh, I don't know, puzzle solving, that kind of stuff yet. Are you always a, a fan of Resident Evil, at least? Like, Do you have a favorite out of the series? Yeah, I really, really love Resident Evil. Uh, I liked uh, number one and two probably equally as much. Mm-hmm. Those are my two favorites. Uh, and I also really like the early Silent Hill games, like one through three. I really fucking uh, love yeah. those. Yeah. Uh, Fatal Frame 2 was a really great series, like Fatal Frame 1 and 2. Fucking amazing. Go. So you've also played the Dot Hack series too, like so you you were yeah. same thing here. So I, I went to the used section of GameStop. I got like every single uh, niche RPG that I could find. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how. It <laughs> well, you know what's crazy to me is uh, I, I can't remember if Dot Hack is uh, Namco or Bandai, but I mean they're merged now. Uh, why the hell is that not a game that's actually been made to be an MMO? Like that, that yeah. game is actually deserving of it, and it would be really fucking cool with the mechanic of how you chose the the randomly generated uh, play areas. Like that could be huge. I don't know why they haven't taken that uh, property and done something with it. it well, kinda, listen, Jim, awesome. they still they still make Digimon, so <laughs> for, <you> know, just... <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I heard Pokemon's going to be a big smash. You know. Oh yeah! Pokemon <laughs> stars. Oh yeah! Uh, actually, you know, Jim, this would be a good segue to uh, your thoughts on the Nintendo Switch. Actually, between yeah. the awkward. Well, I'm not even going to say it. I mean, I'll let you take the reins, Jim. <laughs> um, yeah, I get uh, like people hate my opinions because they think I shit on everything, and they're probably right. But the Nintendo Switch <laughs> seems like a fucking disaster waiting to happen. <laughs> really? You feel that? Okay. Here's the honest truth. I kind of oh, contemplated of buying it. I'm going to be no, the honest truth. I'm going to be that cuck. I promise. Why, I, why don't you cut out the middleman and just burn your fucking money in a pile? <laughs> because you're going to get this damage against at the end of the day. <laughs> well, I did, yeah. own an, I did own a 3DS, though. So I don't know. I kind of I, like the idea. 3, yeah, 3DS is fine. Like, Here's my problem with the Switch. I feel like Nintendo has become too greedy for their own good. Mm-hmm. The prices of the controllers are ridiculous. If you want to get two of the Switch controllers and you need to buy them separately, you can get them as a bundle for 80 bucks. And you mm-hmm. want to get the charging handle, that's another 30 or 40 bucks. So for one functioning Switch controller, right, put together and completely working and will charge your actual, you know, uh, Switch Joy-Cons. Yeah. It's 110 $120. That is fucking crazy. Yeah. A Pro controller is what, 70 or $80? And it literally, uh, another- it literally is it's just an Xbox controller. Yeah, and here's my problem with this. We've seen Nintendo take this path. Like, they always talk about how they're these great innovators, but what they really are are peripheral salesmen, uh, starting with the Wii. Like, you, you, all these different straps and all these different add-on devices, that was their main target for selling to you. Uh, with the Wii U, they got into um, what are the basically their glorified USB sticks. What the fuck are the little statues that everybody went crazy? Uh, Amiibo. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. Hey, can I can I just point something out though? Anthony did buy a Wii U, and I'm going to say that on the no, air. No, I bought the Wii U because I love Smash Brothers, right? I, I bought that. I, I there were some good <laughs> games that are on the Wii U, but now you know with the news about the Switch and everything like that, you know, I mean, what games are when I when they said Mario Kart was coming out for the Switch, I'm like, oh, good, the new Mario Kart, and I was like, wait a second, I went on Wikipedia, and I'm like, no, this is the same Mario Kart, it's just a rehash. So, I mean, if you don't have a Wii U, I would say the only advantage to the Switch is that you could play Zelda, but you could just get a cheap, you can get a Wii U for. Really cheap and still play Zelda on. I mean, the Switch can't even handle 1080, 60 frames per second, which, in my opinion, should be the standard. Yeah, um, well, but... and I'll give you an idea of how much I think the Wii U is shit. I or, or, or the, <laughs> the Switch is shit. I own a Wii U, and even I won't buy a Switch. Yeah, well, okay. right. And so, like, if I want to play Zelda, I'll just get it on the Wii U. 
Yeah. And the Wii U had fucking nothing. Like, this happens every time. They're like, oh, Nintendo's going to finally have third-party support, <laughs> put out first-party games, and they never fucking do. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, looking at the Switch with all the overpriced peripherals for it, looking at the fact that they're including a non-charging controller holder for your Joy-Cons, looking at the fact that it looks like it's almost a little bit underpowered compared to the Wii U, maybe when it's undocked. Like, they don't... Re- what are they selling it as? I mean, it's a portable that's too fucking big to carry with you, and it's an underpowered console. Yeah. So like but, they they pick the worst of both wor- or the worst of both worlds in my opinion to kind of merge them together. It's weird. Yeah. And Jim, I, I live in New York City, so how am I going to be the audience in this? Because if I have that shit in the A train, I'm going to get jacked, Jim. Like this is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not and Will lives in the re- and Will Will lives in a really bad area of the UK. Like, how he is he going to survive with all of his uh, you know sheep around and stuff? Horrendous. Well, and here's the craziest thing to me. Okay, so they're they're talking about how portable it is, right? Yeah. But then they're talking about how each Joy-Con has different functions. Like they've got the IR sensor or whatever, the motion sensor on mm-hmm. the right one. Yeah. Okay, so if I'm using a portable device, if I'm on the bus or if I'm, uh, you know, sitting somewhere waiting to go to class or go to work or where, where the hell I am mm-hmm. out and about, am I going to pull off these fucking Joy-Cons and then start making eating motions towards them? I'm going to look fucking retarded. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you, know, you know, people lose stuff. People lose stuff so easily. How many stylists do you think people lost on their 3DS? Uh, You're right. I lost that thing all the time. I actually lost the 3DS itself. Have one. <laughs> Finger yeah, <hands>. so <laughs> what are you going to do when you lose a Joy-Con controller and it costs you forty dollars to replace it? Um, yeah, I just I don't I don't have a lot of faith oh, in it. And then when I saw the, the lineup of games that are coming out, like for the launch window and the months kind of coming after it. Uh, what they don't have anything like they've got Zelda, and you could argue maybe Bomberman would be fun. Fine. Uh, and then I am Setsune or whatever it is, which is out on other. I think it's on, on the PC. PC. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then all the other stuff are indie games that came out four or five years ago. Like they're talking about like Goo World and shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what? What am I buying the console for? I'm buying it for a game I could play on the Wii U and ports of fucking indie games that have been out for five years. Yeah, but Jim, you could play Coming to America Mario Edition this November. <laughs> You you mean Eddie with starring Eddie Murphy? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> Sorry, Mario. <laughs> At New Donk City. <laughs> right. And that's the craziest thing though, isn't it? I mean, yeah, coming this November. You want to wait seven months to play a game on the system that you bought for three hundred dollars? <laughs> and that's around the time they're gonna implement the uh, online pay too, because I think um the online will be a free service for the first six months. Would, which would anybody think. put up with that from Sony or Microsoft? Would anybody put Hell, up with the if no. Microsoft or Sony? said you need to pay us ten dollars per month to use our service but if you want to do voice chat and group chat with people online you're going to need to use a smartphone app they'd be like go fuck yourself what are yeah. you talking about i did see the specs recently they just released them recently and they do have a headphone jack at a uh, combo mic jack so you can plug in to it like headset wise but the fucked up thing is that the headphone jack head uh, headset combo jack is on top of the console. So now when you're playing it mobile, the wire is going over the screen. Right. Yeah, it the design philosophy behind like I don't even like the bevel. Why do why is there like it's an inch bevel on each side? You're right. It's 2017. There should no be there should be no bevel. Like that's that's the case. It's 2017 yeah, it, and they're using L- LCD screens too. Jumping. The thing that really screws me up is what is the cost going into? Because if you if those Joy Cons are selling for forty or fifty dollars a piece, and the console itself is shipping for three hundred, that means basically that the Joy Cons were a hundred dollars of the console price at market. Yeah. So it's really a two hundred dollar console. It's two hundred dollars worth of technology in it. That's why you've got a beveled screen, and it's using a Tegra X one or whatever, mm-hmm. and it's got a two and a half hour battery life. Like I just like Nintendo does great handhelds. I can't deny that they have great libraries for their handhelds but i i don't know if this is going to work well for them i don't know if they're going to find that the support for their handhelds from third-party companies is going to transition over to the switch and pick up the slack and i hate the fact that they always say oh we sold out on the pre-order when they only had 70 in stock yeah i love the pre-order you're always going to get pre-order people i mean even the wii u sold what was it 15 million over its life cycle yeah, so but, but they're only telling- but like they've been doing this thing. They even did this with the fucking Nintendo. Um, what was it? The Nintendo uh, Retro with like the you know when, the, when they came out with that little oh, thirty yeah, game yeah. console. They did this thing where like they had the console out for like maybe thirty people can buy it. Like maybe it was, it was very limited. They're doing the same thing for the pre order with this console, and well, it's, yeah, it's just I, disgusting I, that they're 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 marketing this as, um, they're marketing this as just. 
oh, it's sold out. Everybody wants to buy it. Yeah, it's trying to create hype. But I, yeah. I think the, the Wii U example with the $15 million over the life cycle, Nintendo has a dedicated fan base that will buy anything from them. You yeah. could have a Japanese man shit in a box and put Nintendo on it. <laughs> Somebody would buy it. Is that a new, uh, fe- is that a new fetish we're going to hear on Deviant? The, <laughs> <laughs> that's just a Japanese What are deal. these hints? <laughs> yeah. But... Um, I, I don't buy the sold out stuff. I mean, that's any console is going to do that. You're, you know, Sony, Microsoft, if you put it out in limited quantities, you're always going to have that hardcore fan base of a couple million people. They're going to snatch up pre-orders. That doesn't impress me. And it, what will impress me is when it's actually in stock in stores and it's past the first month, is anybody buying it? Is anybody picking it up? I, I don't think it's, I got, I, I think Nintendo is approaching what Sega went uh, kind of ran into mm. where they're pushing out technology that isn't where it needs to be when they're juggling too many things that they shouldn't be doing and they don't have, you know, kind of the support network they need to have, uh, you know, Nintendo's got a bank account. Sega didn't have the, that's the only real difference I think, but I think they're making some really fucking bad mistakes right now. And I don't understand the people in charge in Japan. I don't know what is going through their head. I don't, it's like they don't understand what they're doing anymore. It feels like they've kind of lost the path. Yeah. Well, you know, that's why PC gaming's all the rage now. That's why everybody everybody wants to customize their own console to the way they want to they want to run it. Well, I mean, I'll put it like this. Uh, you know, I can go on Steam and I can play uh, Dangaropa. I can play Disgaea. All the Tales games are on it. Uh, Final Fantasy games are on it. Like all those titles that usually would be only on the console are coming over to PC, and they've started with the backlog. They're getting all the older titles out of the way. But now the newer ones are coming out. You've got Guilty Gear from Arc System, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So a lot of the charm that was console ownership of getting these games that, well, why would they ever go to PC, is kind of disappeared. So it really puts the onus on first- and third-party developers to really make some great stuff. And they do occasionally, but it feels like they're few and far in between. And, uh, you know... (sighs) I think with the Wii U, I enjoyed maybe, you know, what is it, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles X? Mm-hmm. It, like, if you want to compare that to Final Fantasy XV, it blows it out of the fucking water as far as, like, <laughs> <laughs> and enemy encounters go. But I can't name more than maybe four or five titles on the Wii U that I thought were really good. And that kind of extends to the PS4 and the Xbox One. I can't name a lot of games and say, like, oh, my God, this is why you need to buy this. And it just it feels like consoles as a whole kind of have been like, what the fuck is going on? No, you're definitely right about uh, flagship titles. I, I think that's kind of what we're alluding to. Jim, can you see yourself making games? Oh no, I have no. I, I don't know how to program. Uh, I'm not an artist. I can't voice act. I'm not a great writer. <laughs> okay, like, you, I don't you are you of, are an artist. Don't say you're not an artist. You no, are an I, artist. I, I don't have any of the necessary traits to even begin uh, working on a game. No. Uh, and with my video release schedule, I'd tell you, like, I'll have a game out in 2018, and by 2030 it would show up. <laughs> gym time, oh, yeah, yes. you'll be, gym uh, time. Uh, like, Hideo Kojima. <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah, going into game development is never going to happen. <laughs> you'll be on gym time. You'll be, like, every like a year later. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> all right, what kind of game would you make, though, if you had all the skills? If you had the GoFundMe, the Patreon, if you were sleeping with developers, what kind of game would you make? I, I don't know. I have a friend named. Uh, You're Jeff sleeping Mattel. with developers. I'm sleeping with publishers. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I wasn't ready for that one. Go ahead. Sorry, it's Jim. It's Monday night. <laughs> sorry, Jim. Go ahead. Well, I've got a friend online, uh, Nervatel. We kind of had a conversation about like what would uh, what would be a fun game to us if we could make one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the basic premise would be like um, a multiplayer, an online multiplayer game. Uh, I, I don't know how you'd structure it. I don't know if it would be with a set amount of time or a set mm-hmm. amount of people, but the basic notion is you're set into a town full of NPCs, mm-hmm. uh, and one person is a serial killer and the other person is on the police force. And that's the entire game is they've got to try to catch you with evidence. So you have the objective of going out at night and murdering NPCs in innovative ways, and they have to gather the evidence to figure out who the fuck you are. Nice. Adult only. Yeah. Adult only. Yeah, yeah, that would be fun to me. <laughs> I like it. That's pretty damn good. You see, you can't. You have to edit this part out because now some asshole out there is going to be like, "Hmm." Yeah, you're, you're right. I hope some asshole does do it. Uh, <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Jim. It really, it really amazes me that you really don't want to monetize on anything that you produce, and it's 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 shocking to me just because I'm a filmmaker myself, and like, and like I just. I love the fact that you don't you don't want to profit off this. You just like you just think it's it's fun. You just love it for its you know itself, and it's great. It really it's so refreshing to hear that from somebody. 
yeah, I, I enjoy it as a hobby uh, for what it is. I, I never went down the monetization route because I didn't really think of it uh, in that regards. I know a lot of people that do. I, I don't have a problem with people doing it. Like Red Letter Media does it. I think their shit's great. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Your Movie Sucks does it. I think his videos are great. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are a lot of people out there that make content and then they monetize and they make money off it. And I'm like, that's perfectly fine. You make good shit. Why yeah. wouldn't you? Um, I, I think part of my hesitation from it is I, I started when – YouTube was young, and that was never even an idea, and anybody yeah. said that they'd make money off of it. And then the other part of it is you you see so many people now making money off the internet, but they do it from whining and bitching. Mm-hmm. Like, oh my god, I'm so oppressed. <laughs> give me, give me money, and it just feels like I don't, I don't want to be. That yeah, guy. I really want, I really want you to make like a Patreon or like a or like a um, what is it, a GoFundMe about like you know my needs by Jim or something. <laughs> you know, I, if if someday I set up a Patreon, I, I'll tell you what'll happen. I'll get maybe about twenty five cents. That's that's about where I'm gonna be sitting. I'll get a I'll get a nice stick of Wrigley gum out of it. That's about- <laughs> <laughs> Jim just wants to buy a gumball. Can you please let that happen? Donate to Patreon. <laughs> oh, man. You know, the, the funny thing too with Patreon is the people that are making the real money are the porn artists. I think the two, uh, like the top three people on Patreon right now are porn artists, and they're making like thirty thousand a month. Oh my god. I, it's crazy. That's yeah, what I'm saying, that. Jim. You got to get the diaper. You got to go out there with the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, I don't know what you're doing with your life, Jim. People would well, pay for it. I mean, your 25 minute videos, they go very fast. Just think what you could do with three hours. <laughs> Yo, boy, there you go. Oh, man. <laughs> Jim, have you ever thought of going into porn? Uh, no, that's never been a profession. I thought that's what I wanted. All right, so besides porn, right? What are some of your favorite movies? Like, can't there some titles or genres? Besides out porn. There? <laughs> besides, yeah, besides, besides porn. Besides I, Busty uh, Cops too, Jim. Oh God, I haven't I haven't seen a good movie in a long fucking time now. Um, I'm trying to think of like the last. You know, I I like again. If going by my video game taste, you probably shouldn't listen to my opinions on movies. But uh, the last one that I really really liked. Uh, oh, I like Seven Years in Tibet. I liked uh, Red Violin. Uh, just shit like that. And people are going to be like, what the fuck are those? Film Noirs? Exactly? Are those Film Noirs? Uh, no, they're not. But no. uh, Film Noir is fine, too. Uh, seven uh, years uh, you're, into, you're into, like, uh, um, uh, the smart people movies, Jim. Yeah. You're, you're, well, well yeah. I'm telling you, Jim Jim is a scholar. I feel like you... Did you... You you went to college, did you? Yep. Did you gra- Did you go to, um, you know, honors college? Did you, go- did you, did you graduate? Did you graduate? No, I, just, <laughs> yeah. I, just, I, just, I just went for fun. You know, just that. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't like plumbing debt for the fun of it? Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, did you, I feel like, honestly, I'm talking to somebody who is very, very intelligent. And that's why oh, I'm asking the question. I, I really want to know, like, did you go to, like, a, a Harvard school? Where did you go, if I can ask that? You don't have to tell me specifically, obviously, you know. Was but, it Ivy League? Did you go to one of the top schools, at least? Yeah. Did you tell us? No, I went to a private religious college. Um, really? I went, yep. I, I got a bachelor's. I initially went in to do education. My plan was to go teach overseas and probably start. I fucking knew it. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and, and start, up, start up my own school. Um, uh-huh. But when I got into practicum, which is basically you're in the classroom, uh, I saw kind of the other side of education, which is the administrative side, and I saw a lot of shit that I really disagreed with. So I went to the people that ran the education department, and I told them I'm not going to be a part of it. I was like, I know I put three and a half, you know, four years into this. Uh, I don't want to do this. Uh, you guys suck. You're perpetuating an industry that hurts kids, and I just, you know, I'm not going to be a part of it. So really, wow. I had, I, I got a general studies BA. So I've got a degree that literally is about as worthwhile as a piece of toilet paper. <laughs> no, but, well, at least, at least you didn't get at least you didn't graduate in gender studies. That's all we're happy about. Yeah, it's OK, Jim. <laughs> uh, yeah. If, if I could do it over again, I'd have gone into business. That's probably what I should have gone into. OK. Well, Jim, I mean, I'll, I'll just say this, though. If you would have went for education, you could have done the corrupt way and you could have uh, opened oh, up. Come your, on. I guess. Well, of some sort. No, here's the thing. Here's what you could have done. You could have got affiliated yourself as a common core group and get a grant, right? And then you could be uh, label yourself as a nonprofit, and then there you go. You you have your own gym university. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> honestly would go to gym university for my master's. Is that possible? Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's here's the thing that I encountered, and the the thing that kind of killed it for me. Quotas do exist. They pass children based on skin color. Um, they don't care if they can read. Mm-hmm. They don't care if they can do math. Uh, all they cared about is the funding they get, really? which 
really sickens me because I think, you know, kids are kids. Uh, they deserve the best they can get. Yeah. And I think it's up to educators and administrators to provide for them. And when you've got a student that can't read or somebody that's falling behind, it's, you know, you should have a program to catch them and to catch them up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, God, I had kids that would write numbers backwards that couldn't spell words. And this is close to the third grade. So the problem is by the time you get in the third grade, it's really going to be a big indicator on how well you're going to be able to read uh, your literacy level, just how well you're going to do into school. So it's really fucking important to get that fixed. Yeah. And they did, they didn't care. They just were like, fuck it, pass them. We need to get the money. We need to get our grants. And when I talked to him about, well, would you let me set up after school programs? Could I get some teachers to volunteer? Could we do something to help these kids? Uh, the answer I got was, we don't have time for that. We don't have money for that because the district is going to be spending $11 million on iPads. And, the, of course, the company that's selling the iPads, the school district, also sells apps that help the students study, but they charge for those apps. So it's like a double dipping kind of thing. So it's all it's just this corrupt shit. And it just it's a disservice to kids. And I, it's too heartbreaking for me to be in an industry where I know that I can't help them. It would fucking crush me after enough time. And that and that's and that's really where your your heart of gold is, honestly. It's humbling it, that, you, yeah, that you feel that way. Well, no, it just it, it's it it makes me feel bad because I know yeah. that, you know, if if there was some kind of a structure set up to kind of support those students, they would have a much better chance of succeeding later yeah. on. So and you, a lot of those kids had an interest. I mean, they, you know, they, they were interested in shit, but they just couldn't do it because they didn't have the knowledge or the ability. Yeah. If we had caught them caught up to that level, they, they would have been fine. So are you trying to say that you're Morgan Freeman and your life is a <laughs> San God. Wait, no, wait, what's that movie called? Not Stand and Deliver, the other one. I, I don't know. I, uh, there, uh, some, never mind. He, All right, never you know, mind. You, you're thinking of Robin Williams in um in the Dead Poet Society. Not Robin Williams. Yeah, he's but a Robin yes, Williams. He that too. He he's Robin that Williams. But, uh, no, I'm not. I'm not saying I would have been some um, you know monolithic <laughs> amazing teacher. Oh, Captain, <laughs> my cap. You are my captain, though. Oh, Captain, <laughs> my captain. But uh, you know, it, that's that's not just my experience. I talk to a lot of professors, and I talk to a lot of people in education, and, yeah. and even administrators, and they all said the same thing. Yeah, the system sucks. Yeah, there yeah. are a lot of problems, and nobody's really addressing any of them. No, and and, and, and the other problem is that you have these these terrible students who are still in the class. And I don't mean terrible as in poor performers. I'm talking like real bad kids, like bad dudes, who are still left in a classroom, and it creates a learning. Uh, a catastrophe for other students who actually do want to be there. I remember going to Florida uh, for high school and like they let these bad kids still stay in schools instead of like setting aside like a classroom for the, I'm not talking remedial kids. Like I'm talking real bad dudes. I mean, Jim, do you have any take on that or? Well, yeah, I encountered it. Um, I actually had one kid and you know, this is me in a, a different classroom, a different grade level, but hmm. uh, stood up on the desk, started throwing books at people and when the teacher said, you know, get down, don't do that, they're like, fuck you, you can't touch me. <laughs> wow. If you touch me, if you touch me my parents will sue you. The teacher couldn't okay. do anything. They had, to wait, they had to wait 20 minutes for the principal to come down to do something because they didn't have the authority to touch the student. Wow. That's uh, disgusting. That really is. It is because you've got a classroom full of kids that can't do shit because you've got somebody throwing a fucking tantrum and whipping books at people. Uh, oh, the teacher, sh God. you know, again, there's there it, the kids know this. They know teachers can't fucking do anything in retaliation. Yeah. And I'm not even talking about corporal punishment or discipline. I'm just saying basic common sense. Like, get the fuck out of my room. Yeah. But, you know, like the, they know this and they exploit it. So, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And, yeah, it sucks because disgusting. they got their hands tied behind their back. They can't do shit. Are you a fan of Common Core? Fuck no. Good, good, <laughs> good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'll tell you, I have, I have family who, I have family who actually are teachers as well, and they, they can't, they are fucking furious at the Common Core. Uh, I covered this in a video. One of the guys that helped write the, uh, the, you know, like the foundational uh, guidelines behind what Common Core would become. Yeah. Did it because he believed uh, white people have too much privilege. He actually said this at a teacher conference. Really. And this goes back to my argument about quotas. Mm -hmm. Common Core is a way of dumbing down curriculum to pass kids that wouldn't be able to pass under more stringent guidelines. Because here's the thing. If we admit there's a problem and students need help, then we've actually got to create a real solution. But if we dumb down the curriculum enough, then the problem goes away and we don't have to expend the energy to fix the actual issue. Yeah, That's what Common Core is. It's a way of avoiding the fucking problem. And also marginalizing the grade scores so that we have a, a better number of what we have in the in the country, and it really is disgusting when you look at students as just numbers. Well, yeah, that that's my one of my main uh, 
takeaways from it, and one of the things that really annoyed me the most, is they aren't individual students. They don't think of them as, you know, an individual. They think of them as a box to tick off on a list. Do I have my quota? That's mm -hmm. all they, that's really what it is at the end of the day at the higher levels. And it's wrong. You're, you know, if these kids aren't at the level they need to be by middle of elementary school, uh, they're in a lot of trouble. If they leave elementary school and they are behind, they're going to be behind throughout the entirety of junior high and high school. I mean, that's just the reality. And you can, college isn't really going to be an option for them. So you've got to really put the effort in at the early ages. And they weren't willing to do that. It just feels like they're trying to avoid it. That's what it feels like to me. I could be wrong, but that's my takeaway. No, you're right. You're completely, you're 100% right about that. Because I see it even in college right now. I'm a student in college right now. I'm, I'm actually graduating this semester. And the kids that are about to graduate, they don't know a fucking thing. They haven't done shit. They think that a college, they think that an internship on campus is going to help them in their career. It's a fucking yeah, that, joke. That, that's great. Uh, you know what I, I always found funny, too, was uh, they t they'll think internships on a college campus or like some student work program is a big deal. And then you bring up something like job shadowing and they have no idea what that is. Like, what what do you mean I can go out into the to the actual business world and work under somebody and get an idea of what they are and kind of get a network going and establish contacts and get yeah. my name out there? Like, they have no idea. It's really like they're coming from the crib and being thrown directly out into the street, unprepared for the reality of what it's like to get a job in the marketplace and to try to create a career uh, for themselves. They, they're they going to be fucked. They are. They are it going pretty, to be fucked. It's pretty sad because uh, uh, as the uh, quote unquote evil HR guy, when you have applicants. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll say for... this. But wait, before you get in here, Mr. Medicare, uh <laughs> Anthony is an HR representative. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I see a lot of applicants who apply even for internship programs here after uh, graduating uh, college and everything like that. And then, you know, in, in my opinion, if you're 24 and it's two years after college and you're applying for an internship, it's it, it kind of sets like a, a tone, that, like what the hell is going on between schools? Because they're not teaching resume writing courses. They're not teaching... Um, uh, stuff to advance in the workplace, whether it's through physical labor or through other means like through Excel or, or Microsoft Word or anything like that, or even just getting up to date with technology like web production and all that stuff. I think there are some things that like a lot of students are unprepared for and teachers, and I'm not saying all teachers, there are some teachers that are really good, but they're, but students are also not preparing themselves for that because they're not shown, uh, they're not being guided that way. If that well, yeah, sense. common sense has disappeared. Like the notion that, you know, okay, I have the education, but I need to show some extra worth beyond that. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's a notion that's kind of disappeared these days. Like kids, they get their degree and then they have no experience and they're like, what am I supposed to do? Well, you know, if, you, if you'd if taken a little bit of time, you, you don't have to invest a ton of it, but if you'd taken a little bit of time to learn one or two extra skills, if you'd learned a computer program, if you'd taken the resume writing course, if you'd done a little job shadowing, it would have put your name a little higher on the list. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If, if you knew how to do an interview comfortably, where you go in and talk to somebody like they're a normal person, yeah. why are you good for this job? What do you bring to this job? How dedicated will you be? Like basic stuff. But like that common sense isn't there anymore. And I feel like a lot of kids leaving uh, university go out with a liberal arts degree, especially. I think that's the one that's hardest hit. Mm -hmm. And um, they're like, holy shit, I'm so, I'm so far in debt and nobody wants to hire me. What what do I do? What the hell do I do? And they end up taking a job that's maybe minimum wage and they've got a BA and they're like, holy shit, what the hell just happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and not to mention even uh, what you kind of lean towards there, especially in, in personalizations, interpersonal contact. Um, I've had conversations with a lot of these applicants who would come in. Right. And I make I'm not a, a, a bullshit, you know, in the sense that, like, I don't like to ask trick questions. Right. I'm very like to the point, you know, I'm like, hey, you know, what are you doing here today? Uh, how is everything? Blah, blah, blah. And I'll talk about their experience, not experiences. But I'll yeah. talk about what they went in school because I, I look at their resumes in advance and they don't like keep eye contact. They don't really articulate themselves well. Me, I'm all about personality, so I, I couldn't care last if like you're like the best person in the world in terms of skills or not like i i can't train a personality yeah. and that's another thing too because you, you're out of these universities you get people who are just they have this chip in their shoulder mm -hmm. where it's like they're like why is this all happening to me right now and it's it's a little harder to get reach out to them and i and i don't really hire them for that will is, is it is it as bad as it is here in america <laughs> no it's not it's not really that bad over here but 
it, it's getting that way. It, is, it really it? is. It, uh, Mr. Medgar, have you ever met a, a British person, by the way? This is, this is Will. I don't know if he, he hasn't been here at all the entire time, so I just want to reintroduce <laughs> him. No, no, yeah, I, I've met a few British people. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, they're kind of mythical, like unicorns, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll right. encounter them in the forest under a rainbow. <laughs> all right, Zach, let's tell him the truth. I've been Will the whole time. That's my British accent. Oh, yeah, so yeah, you're right. Yeah, it, oh, it's true. Oh, 24 hour ops complete. You got me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and, and f- by the way, I had to Google it, but the movie with Morgan Freeman is Lean on Me. So, Jim, oh, okay. you are starring in Lean on Me too. It's going to be straight to DVD. This is going to be the start of your film career. <laughs> there you go. But, yeah, I agree with you what you're saying about uh, the eye contact thing and just it, just basic uh, kind of communication skills. Uh, I, I think one of the problems is they train so hard for the position that they forget that they're going to be in a workplace, and the workplace involves people. Yeah. So if you can't talk to people, if you don't know how to have a professional relationship with coworkers, you know, at the very minimum with the person interview, you're in for a tough, a tough, tough time. It's going to be a rough ride for you. <laughs> I just don't understand it. I don't understand what their mentality is to not want, not to really just try to succeed in what they want in life. You know, that doesn't make any uh, sense to me. Well, I, I, I talked about this briefly a long, long time ago, but I think it comes down to, at least in America, I don't know you know, what it's like in Europe, but uh, at least in America, we have kind of this everybody's a winner mentality. Yeah. And it's created kind of a, a narcissism that's just gone out of control. And social media has played a part in that. Feminazi. Like everything, everything's about me. <laughs> I'm special. I've got all the participation trophies. I'm unique. Nothing's ever my fault. And, you know, when you go through life with that, that kind of drilled into your head and then you're finally on your own and you realize, wait a minute, I'm a colossal fuck up and I don't know how to own up to that. It's really tough. It it's is. really, really tough to readjust. And I think that's why snowflakes go out into the winter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What, were you saving that one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just made that one up right on the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jim, I, I think I think I want to go back to now. Um. Let's go back to you, and I guess we'll wrap it up here because this has been a long conversation. I really do appreciate you taking the time here. Honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm honored that you even took the time here to, uh, to come on the show for the first place. And, and this long, too. It's a freaking an hour and whatever. Um, I yeah, Jim, I'll send you more naked photos if you want. Yeah, oh, it, it, uh, is, no, it a, is. It's a great prize. Yeah, I, I mean, turn on your webcam. I'll show you what I'm wearing right now. <laughs> but, like, listen, Jim, Jim listen, I, I just – it's amazing to me, and I'm just going to go back to this idea, that you have been able to, first off, keep this audience. I've said this before. Keep the audience. And number two, keep your identity, too. Because nobody has ever seen what you look like. And it amazes me, still, that no one knows what you look like. Except for the, the scout of uh, Team Fortress 2, I think you said, but that's... Uh... There you go. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, again, it, it goes back to kind of the the time period that I most enjoyed on the internet. It's like social media as it exists today with Facebook and Twitter and, you know, even before that kind of with MySpace and YouTube and just God, like you cam and Instagram and everything that wasn't around, you know, you really were just some random avatar and a username. And that was kind of your identity. And that was kind of how you interacted with people. And I'm just used to it. I, I don't see it. The, what the fuck is the point of putting my face out there, my de- uh, identity out there. It doesn't, change or alter any of the content that i'm putting out so it just it feels kind of like hey look at me you know so it just doesn't appeal to me <laughs> all right but, but but you do look like the aristocrat though right come on <laughs> <laughs> that that was that was, that was, well, that was quite that was quite literally the first search result uh for any other aristocrat <laughs> that's why i picked it it was a halloween costume <laughs> J- jim by the end of this interview can i just at least get one headshot no. Fuck. Oh, come on. <laughs> Fuck. A little stick figure. Come on. Come on. Anything. I need to see what you look like. I need to see that face. <laughs> it's killing me. All right. Fine. I just, guess. just, just envision your typical, you know, uh, black female in a wheelchair. And that's <laughs> kind of what I was like. Oh man. <laughs> Will, you have, a, you have another question? Will. Yo. Yo, Will. <laughs> What the hell? I think uh, he fell asleep. I think he fell asleep. Will. He's, he's, he's asleep, yeah. He's gone off to dreamland. I, you know what it is? It's, it's British time, so I think once it turns midnight, they all turn into, like, um... Stone, like trolls, yeah. <laughs> 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 it's, it's all the drinking he does, too. He does a lot of drinking, this guy. Yeah, it's too much. Are, are you a drinker? Are you a drinker, uh, Mr. Medigar? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Socially, I am. I like drinking. What uh, What is I've your beer drinking. choice before I before I guess let you go? Uh, you're not a beer guy. You're more like a. I, I'm not a beer guy. I'm a hard liquor guy. Uh, ah. vodka, just, just vodka straight up. I like to get to the point. If I'm gonna get drunk, I'm just gonna get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> vodka straight up. That's it. There's no no like mixing it with anything. Just just straight vodka. Uh, maybe, maybe on occasion I'll have it on the rocks, but that's about it. Oh, come Total on. That's not mixing it, but whatever. <laughs> that's adding that, something to it. No, to, to me, that's mixing it. You're diluting <laughs> it. <laughs> I, could, I could see you as a Jack guy, though. Uh, you know, yeah, I've, I've always stuck to vodka, and I, I particularly <laughs> like uh, the shit that tastes like paint thinner, so Karkoff is the way I go on that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you can slowly kill yourself to, right? Well, you want to know that you're doing damage, so it has to taste <laughs> awful. That's my philosophy on it. Oh, man. <laughs> Mr. Medicker, where can they find you if they don't know who you are yet and they want to check you out? Oh, uh, my YouTube channel is Mundane Matt. You can find me there. <laughs> oh, God. God. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. I love it when you show up and you greet me by saying, hey, faggot, kill yourself. Uh, so just show up on my videos, Mundane Matt on YouTube, and just say, hey, faggot, kill yourself. <laughs> uh, by the way, I want you to I want you to know something. I did see in the recent video that you posted uh, about uh, from Deviant. I I want you to know this because I don't think anybody noticed this, but I did. I noticed the name you used when you published yourself onto their their little safe space, oh, and I it, thought it, that was hysterical. <laughs> uh, yeah, the funny thing to me is that's been sitting there for four months. <laughs> <laughs> That's been sitting there for four months with links going to every fucking website he can inhabit. So <laughs> and nobody it. noticed. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Jim, I love your work. Uh, we all love your work here on the show. And we really thank you so much for joining us here for such a long time, too. It's been a dream come true for both of us. And uh, we really wish you the best of luck on all your success on YouTube and on um, on all your platforms. And, you know, we're, we're, behind, we're behind you 100%. And you're welcome back anytime. We'd love to chat with you again. Um, whenever you're free, and yeah, yeah, uh, no, I, I, I had a good time. Of course, I enjoyed enjoyed coming on. Not a problem. Thanks I, so I much. Have to come back anytime you want. Jim, thank you so much for joining us here on uh, Uncensored Live. Really appreciate it. Listen live Mondays, five Eastern, ten PM Greenwich Mean Time on Z Radio Live.